If you could design a theme park, what would it be like? What attractions would it have? What kind of food and drink would you offer? What kind of rides would you have? Very advanced icebreaker question. This is the yeah. This is the start of season two, though. So I thought we should like <laughs> like Master Chef Legends. Yeah, right. Season two exactly. Legends. Exactly. All right. I think we've got theme parks on the brain for this summer. Um, I I would make a coffee themed theme park. And you could ride the latte cups instead of the teacups. <laughs> and nice, you nice. could um, get poured out of the milk pitcher. Yeah, yeah. Go okay. down a the water ride sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you could do real milk. That would be messy. That would yeah, be, yeah. yeah, that would be a health hazard. But yeah, yeah you could be... have coffee drinks, you could have cold brew, you could have um, coffee coffee brisket yeah yeah how about you so as a as a as as a child of the 80s oh i know where this is going (laughs) yeah you know i would do a stranger things theme yeah you would yeah so (laughs) so of course we would have to have the haunted house right we have to have haunted house okay we would have to have um a karaoke stand where you could sing your anti-vecna song you know so if you wanted to like, you know, re, you know, belt out the uh, rendition of Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill. Of course. Um, and for those of you who have not seen Stranger Things or have like been under a rock some way, somehow, sorry, but. We're just are way less nerdy than Coach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for those of you who have a life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, lots of people have watched Stranger Things who have a life. That's probably true. That's probably true. Uh, so th- there also be like a like an Eggo waffle stand. <laughs> Eggo waffle stands. We'd have a stand for coffee and contemplation that, of course, only be open in the morning. Okay. No, hoppers, coffee and contemplation. You know. Oh, hoppers. More coffee. Morning <laughs> is for coffee and contemplation. And cigarettes. And cigarettes. <laughs> so we, we, no. Yeah, okay. No cigarettes Maybe in no the theme park. Yeah, Maybe cause... candy cigarettes. No, You'd be that. like Hopper. Yeah. It'd be like the only theme park in the world that has a contemplation space. Yeah. Yeah. True. <laughs> I bet the parents would love it. Like, go yeah. over there, children. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we would have to have a bicycle ride very similar to oh. ET at Universal Studios. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, it would be the mm-hmm. only air conditioned ride, just like at Universal. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's probably more air conditioned rides now, but uh, yeah, there, definitely there would be Demogorgons instead of AT. So it'd be a little more way less cute, <laughs> way less cute, more jump scary, but yeah. you know, maybe a little nine player, you know, thrown into the mix. Vecna right. showing up at the end. Ugh, Vecna. Well, Stranger Things, it's a horror theme park. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? So to our listeners, welcome to season two, season two, episode one of the Kimberly <laughs> Coach Show, where we bring you actionable practices you can use in your leadership and collaboration. Today, I'm Coach Kimberly is right next to me. Today, we're talking about how to activate the genius on your team and some things you can do today to actually start that journey. So yeah, we wanted to kick off this season and kind of start back at the foundational stuff that we all of our leadership is based on, which is essentially around team intelligence. Some people use the term collective intelligence or communal intelligence, but how do you activate the genius on your team? So if you are leading people, how can we get them more engaged, contributing more, kind of working in their zone of genius? Um, that's what we're going to start with for this season. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so start to kick us off with talking about what is this thing called team intelligence. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I know the term team. I know the term intelligence, right? but I don't know the two words together. So. Right. And is it different than the sum of individual intelligence on a team? Right. Right. And and I would argue emphatically that it is. Mm -hmm. So you can have a team full of highly intelligent people that doesn't work intelligently together. (laughs) <laughs> you've probably all been on this team you know you've no. watched this team like how how did they do that that thing that went so sideways and and usually there's a couple of key reasons for that one is low engagement so people have a lot of intelligence but they're not bringing it to the table they're kind of mm. sitting through the meeting waiting for the meeting to end you know they've clocked in they're clocking out you know oh my gosh 
I love when you're in a meeting and everybody's looking at you like, it's like, would you please shut up? <laughs> please make this meeting be over. <laughs> um, so, so then when you get under that, what causes low employee engagement? And when you get into um, some of the Gallup polls and, and employee engagement research that they've done, one of the key reasons why people are not engaged is that they don't feel invited. They don't feel like their contribution is actually appreciated or welcomed. They've been told in various ways to stay in their lane. Mm. And so they might see something that maybe is going to go sideways, but they don't tell anybody because like, nobody cares what they think. And so part of it is that, that question of invitation. And then part of it is how well does the team understand each other so that they know who to look to for various situations? Mm. That's interesting because I think a lot of team, this is, you know, this is the kind of idea we've talked about a lot in the past where if you have a lot of people hire people for their team that are much like them. Yes. And then they just end up with like, you know, they just want to like build a set of robot arms. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm going to have some meat puppets, you know, doing, doing my bidding. Come here, minions. And it doesn't, that never minions works is very well. Such a cuter phrase now than it once was. Yeah. I Much guess. better than meat puppets. <laughs> but, but the idea often people have come into leadership and they think essentially they've inherited an idea that I have all of the vision and the brains and my team will carry out my vision sort of like minions, usually less cute in corporate spaces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and what happens is you're kind of shutting down the intelligence of the people on your team because they're learning from you. You don't care about my thoughts and ideas. You yeah. care about your thoughts and ideas. So I'm just here to do what you tell me. And I don't really care anymore whether that's good or not good or whether it's the best thing for our team. And so their level of engagement drops, drops, drops. And it's because we have this idea and we've talked about this before, but you often hear in corporate spaces, like if I just had five of me, then I would, I would do so great. And what they mean is I'm the only brain that matters here, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wouldn't say that. But, but it's what's underneath it. Like, <laughs> I wish everybody was exactly like me. If I could have one brain and 12 arms, then we would have all this more manpower to do all of my great ideas. But the rest of their team is only there to carry out their ideas in that theory. And so you basically have six people around a table, but only one brain that's active. And obviously, you're going to have a less intelligent team then. You have less um, perspective, yeah. at the very least. Plus great results, too, because when you have one perspective... You have, you can see when you're going down the road, you have one set of eyes and if there's a big hole in the road. You're not seeing it because you're looking over here at squirrel, you know, um, <laughs> right. whatever it is, uh, then you, but if you got more sets of eyes from different perspectives, you can see that hole coming. You can right. see where the danger's lying and maybe you could, oh, I don't know, avoid it. That'd be fun. Right. <laughs> Theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> maybe not in the corporate theme park maybe that is the ride <laughs> only one set of eyes, one set of eyes. <laughs> you just navigate the potholes yeah. yeah but when we when we shift our thinking about leadership into a team intelligence paradigm what we start to look for as leaders is people who see the world differently than us people who mm. have their strengths live in our blind spot and so together we make a more intelligent duo. Let me add a third person, a fourth person to that. And if what we have, if we all complement each other's blind spots and every strength casts its shadow, every strength comes with a set of weaknesses, you know? And so when we pick people who are very different than us, then that means that there's sometimes going to be more tension on a team. We are allergic to tension. We feel like, oh, I just want everybody to be just like me because then we'll never fight which of course eventually unravels because no one's just like you, right? right. <laughs> but, but in the meantime, if we find those people with whom we have tension of perspective, we actually then get more intelligent as a team, as long as we have the tools to actually be listening to each other, to invite that, um, that input and contribution. Yeah. I think one of the things, this is not things that we're really taught. No. You know, I mean, a lot of people just come into, into a team or into leadership just thinking like these things just happen. Like people just have leadership gifts and goals. And sometimes people have like leadership instincts. Sure. They have a yeah. natural charisma. They may have a natural persuasion. Uh, but that 
honestly can only take you so far until we start hitting, you know, and start hitting real rough patches. And sometimes the instincts aren't quite good enough to dig you out. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why we, when we started looking at this and we, when we start meeting with clients around these things, we need to have a repeatable, replicatable process, <laughs> a, you know, handles and levers, if you will, mm -hmm. to be able to work through these tensions, to be able to appreciate each other's perspectives. And that I think is kind of how leaders can start to start to look at, okay, what kind of tools, what kind of vocabulary are available for me to start thinking about? And this is not something that yeah. like for some shops, they like go whole hog into like a massive big program with, uh, with Clifton strengths or like impact, which is one of our specialties. Um, but even if you don't go whole hog into a full yeah. departmental program, which I mean, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. But even if you as an individual leader start to learn mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. differing work styles and not to, and not to weaponize these things, this, right. is, this is the gotcha. It's a whole different this. podcast, but yeah. A different <laughs> podcast probably, but, uh, but to have that appreciation that says, Hey, I'm different than you. And the differences that we have are valuable important and necessary and the different perspectives uh can help our team help our team be made stronger now this is mm -hmm. one of i think one of the reasons that people don't do this because this is hard yeah i think there's almost two parts to shifting into this kind of a mindset and the first is kind of an internal leadership paradigm shift like okay i want the full engagement of my team i want to hire people who have different perspective than mine but then there there's a second part, which is, do I have the tools to actually activate that? Right. And so a lot of right. people, if you only do the first part, you hire for a difference of perspective, you start to invite everybody's opinions, and then you don't actually know how to manage those things. <laughs> um, you don't have any real tools in place, any real kind of framework for doing that, and nobody's really ready for it. And so it can feel like, well, that just was hard. I'm going to go back to people who are just like me as much as possible, you know? Right, right. And so one of the things that we do is we often walk into a team and we choose what we call a language of value. And basically it's a language for looking at team intelligence, looking at individuals, giftings and perspectives. And so you can kind of pick your poison. Any language you use is going to give you some sort of framework. So some of that we like, he just mentioned um, Clifton Strengths. We use the impact a lot with clients. Uh, we also use Enneagram. So often I ask people, do you speak Enneagram? And they either go, oh yeah, or they go, what? Any of what? <laughs> and then you already know What's the answer. That? Like, they don't even know that word. Um, but Enneagram is like a, a rabbit hole, like an Alice in Wonderland, you fall down it. There's so much detail, so much. You kind of have to learn the language to speak it. And so if you want to have a conversation about Enneagram, you kind of have to have, like he's talking about handles and levers, some idea mm -hmm. of, of what are we talking about? But when you pick something like that, whether it's Myers-Briggs or DISC or any of these things, and you start to look at, okay, the people on our team are not exactly the same. Their perspectives, their preferences, their reactions to things, the ways they collaborate, they are different. And that difference inside of that difference is where our team intelligence lies then having language to be able to name that gives people a way to talk about, here's what I need to really be in my zone of genius. But also it gives us understanding of the ways that people operate on our team, the ways that they see things, the ways that we can capitalize and bring out that genius of our team. Yeah. It's kind of like if you were in construction and you didn't know how to talk about lumber, okay? So if you didn't know the difference between a two by four and plywood and the difference between a 10 penny nail and a screw, you know, I mean, like the basic of the basics of the basics, <laughs> um, team intelligence tools like impact, like Enneagram, like right. Clifton strings and disc. And there's lots of different fun tools out there, you know, and lots of people say, well, which one's the best? I'm like, well, they're, they're all really good. They all have strengths and weaknesses. Right. Mm -hmm. But you need to have something, at least in your own head. 
You yeah. know what? If your team, if you can implement it, you can roll it out to your whole team. That's awesome. That's amazing. Like, you know, we've saw, we've seen some tremendous results in those kinds of spaces. Sure. Yeah. But also some people on the team may not be receptive to it. You know, some teams in certain industries, they're like, hmm, this sounds like something that's intrusive and I don't like it. I don't understand it. No, <laughs> that's their response to some of that, you know. And although I will tell you, those people eventually tend to come around at least a little. They do. It's like, oh, that they actually do. is yeah. very helpful. Wow. Because as people start to, it also becomes a shared substance right. in the team as well. When you've got something that you can share in that shared vocabulary mm-hmm. does build bridges. It does build communication pathways, interestingly enough, in between your team members and can be a launching path for all kinds of other conversations when you have a common ground. And that I think is one of the most important parts of having that language of value is having that common ground to begin with. Yeah. And I would add to that. It actually is creating neural pathways too. We're going to have some episodes in this season with some neurobiology people that are going to be really fun. We've already recorded them. And so, um, but what the, one thing that happens is in your brain, you need kind of exposure to ideas to build different pathways for how, how the brain thinks about things. And so in learning a language, like for example, Clifton strengths, you are learning, people are different than me and that gives them strengths and their strengths are different than mine. And the way that we work together will, we will partner differently because my strengths are different than your strengths. But what it's doing is it's building a pathway to see someone's difference in a positive way. And in our culture and in human nature, we tend to see people's differences first in a negative way. So if I'm extroverted and I go to try to talk to my coworker and they say, can't really talk right now. I'm really busy. Like, could, could you be more quiet in your cubicle? Actually, (laughs) just a common uh, request to me. So, um, I might originally think, wow, that person's kind of a jerk. Like they, they, they don't like people. Like they're, they're not friendly, you know, right. no, they're, they're actually probably very friendly when they're not trying to work. They, they're maybe mm-hmm. introverted. They need like a little bit more mental space. Yeah. And so when I start to have language for that, I can have an, instead of a knee jerk negative reactivity, I could see difference and see possibility an opportunity. And that is something that has to shift in your brain actually. And so by, by learning a language for that, it gives us an opportunity to create those pathways yeah. Um, yeah. inside of our brain, inside of our perspective. Yeah. So like we said, any of the tools that are out there and available, uh, we've mentioned some already, you know, we'll list them off in the show notes as well, but uh, almost any tool can give you a, a good foundation. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there are certain tools that we like because they're more positive, you know, than not some of the other tools. But one of the most simplest, one of the most yeah. simplest that you can actually start thinking about right now is what we call VAK. Yep. Uh, visual auditory kinesthetic. So we all process information, assuming that, that the faculties are in full in operation with our eyes, with our ears, with our hands on and feelings. That's the kinesthetics, by the way. That's the, the fancy word for feelings and hands-on. Mm. Everybody has a preference for how they process information. And when you get into like a preference, you know, this is not something to like pigeonhole people into. But listen, if you really like strawberry ice cream and you really don't like chocolate, and some one of your coworkers goes to say their favorite ice cream shop and brings you back chocolate when you full well know that they have strawberry, but do they know that you have like strawberry? Well, we don't know, but everybody has a preference between chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla ice cream, right? Everybody has a preference. Where did that preference come from? Some people are like, well, it's genetic. Some people it's like, it's, it's cultural, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Nostalgia. Right. You know, <laughs> nostalgia. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter where their preference comes from. Everybody has them, right? And everybody has a preference about how they communicate, how they receive communication. Now, everybody has a primary and a secondary, right? So I'm auditory kinesthetic. If you want to communicate with me, you have to talk to me, okay? And if I need to learn something, then after I listen to information about it, I have to put my hands on it. 
it makes me quite adept at technological things. As a matter of fact, I've been doing technology for 20 something years. It's crazy. Okay. Um, but Kimberly, on the other hand, is visual kinesthetic. So here's, <laughs> here's the rub. Okay, so we learned this fairly early is that whenever Kimberly and I are having an important conversation, we need to be sitting across the table from each other. She needs to be able to look at my face because she's going to gather additional data from my face. She needs to be look. I need to be looking at her, at her in the eyes. If I'm not looking at her, she doesn't think I'm tuned in. I'm not paying attention. Now I'm auditory. Okay, so I need to hear. I don't necessarily need to see you in order to process information, but she needs me to see to be looking at her. And so, of course, what am I going to do? Am I going to you know stop looking at her when I'm trying to have a conversation? No, I'm tuned in to how she's communicating and how she needs to be communicated to. And once you start to realize that everybody has these kinds of preferences, there's only three, okay? <laughs> Which I think this is really easy. There's a ton of research out there on it. There's some people are all like, oh, this is blah, blah, blah. This is, you know, this well, is false. In anything you talk about, someone will be All like... of these things, everybody <laughs> has something to say about it. But let me tell you, it works. Yeah. Over and over and over again, it works, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, back when I was a high school teacher, I used this with a whole bunch of inner city high school kids, you know what, and my failing students, most of the time they went up to A's and B's just because I shifted my communication style with them. You know, it's, it's kind of magic once you start understanding that everybody yeah. has their own preference. And if you can tune into that. You see this a lot in training as yeah. well. So if you're thinking, mm -hmm. especially about VAK, Think about times when you're trying to dispense information. So a lot of times with training, people come into a company and they only receive auditory training. So they'll say, you, you know, your first day you're walking through and they'll say, this is where this is. And this is how you do this. And someone's just talking to them and they're going, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. If that's me, and since I don't process auditory cues very well, most of it is not going to stick. And so I'm going to have to come back. And then you could look at that like, oh, maybe maybe she doesn't process information auditorily very well. Or you could look at that like, oh, this new girl is kind of dumb. She doesn't remember anything. <laughs> you know what? And, and so, like I said, people have negative reactions to people's differences. Right, right. So learning, for example, how your team is wired for learning and how they input information will help you train and communicate with your team if you oh, are yeah. a leader. Mm -hmm. um, and it can just be really helpful. So when when I'm trying to communicate with somebody that I know is visual, then I want to make sure that I can draw. I have a whiteboard. I get a piece of paper and we start mapping something. Um, I'm a person who doesn't love an outline. I love like a word web, you know, <laughs> because I want to see it. Some people don't need that. So I could waste a lot of their time doing that. And what they really want is just like a clear cut linear auditory thing. Right. And often people need, especially when they're training to do a task, they actually need to put their hands on it. So no matter how much you stand in front of them and tell them how to do it, it won't really click until they do it with mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. hands. And so that is really helpful when you're training and leading as well to oh, say yeah. like, let's just get in there. Mm -hmm. And then I will answer your questions as you go can often be the most effective way to train. Yeah. Especially if someone's really strongly kinesthetic, like mm -hmm. my dad, okay. is kinesthetic auditory <laughs> to the max, to the max. Oh what I've learned gosh. is that if I need to have a conversation with my dad, we need to go for a walk usually because <laughs> he needs to be moving, right? Mm -hmm. He needs to be moving. He needs to be in his body. And, you know, we're both, we have, we both have a really strong auditory sense. We, so we have great auditory, mm -hmm. auditory input, but my dad needs to be moving when he's talking, you know, and it really enhances how he processes information. It's just how it's his preference, Right. So tune into the preferences of your team. One quick, easy way to, to tune into the preferences, start to listen to how, what kind of words they use, okay? So whenever you tell them something, if they say, hey, that sounds good. Oh, you know what? One or one, there's primary or secondary is probably going to be auditory. Mm -hmm. And just as Kimberly has said, oh, I see that. Mm -hmm. You said that a couple of times, actually, in the, <laughs> in the podcast. Um, <laughs> You know, I was like, oh, they're probably either secondary or primary uh, visual. And, or it's like, or if you have someone say, hey, you feel me on this, you know? 
They're very strongly kinesthetic because they're seated in their emotions and how they process information hands on. Mm -hmm. So if you just listen for those simple clues, listen for those simple yeah. clues, start to, you know, if you have to take notes, take notes, if you, you know, if it helps, but start to identify the people on your team and how they communicate. And that can be a great place to start. There are assessments that you can have them take oh, yeah. also that are pretty <laughs> quick. Um, and some of those phrasing things, they can be cultural. So, I mean, I do use the phrase sounds good and I'm not auditory at all, but um, not very often, no, but <laughs> not as often as I'll use a visual phrase. Yeah. Um, but you can also, you can kind of guess and test this as a leader, even if people mm -hmm. aren't very aware of their own style, because we don't necessarily have language around our preferences all the time, which is right. where these languages of value can really help. But if they're not sure, you can kind of play with it. If you know about this and say, like, I'm going to see if I just tell them how much that clicks for them versus if I show them. If I have a visual, do I need slides for this group or not need slides? Yeah, do I want yeah. to just sit them down and let them figure it out and ask questions? Which thing works really well for them? You know, and you mm -hmm. can kind of figure it out and kind of make a mental note. Like when I'm working with Kimberly, she needs a visual aid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that, that way you, at least you know that, but then as the team gets to know that about each other, then you get that shared substance and you get the ability for us to communicate better. And we as a team become more intelligent. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the easiest one because you don't need to learn a whole system. It's really just three facts. People fall into three buckets and, mm -hmm. and you can just use that information. When you get into something like on the far end of that is probably Enneagram, very complex. <laughs> you can do some intro stuff, but then it's like, there's a lot in Enneagram. You're going to need some big investment to get everyone on your team speaking Enneagram. Mm -hmm. But you, as, as a person who is a leader, could do Enneagram and still use parts of it with your team, even if you, they haven't done typing and things like that. Right. So right. Mm -hmm. we may even talk about that this season. We may. Mm, maybe. <laughs> so as we bring this conversation in for a landing, you can catch more of our content over at KimberlyandCoach.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, podcast feed on Apple Podcasts or Google. And thanks for tuning in to the Kimberly and Coach Show, where we endorse charcuterie boards filled with exotic cheeses and snacks as a way to spread happiness and joy to your neighbors, family, and friends. We'll see you next time. Cheers.